Good morning, Southside. I'd like to welcome anyone who might be visiting with us this morning. We are always grateful to have anyone come join us to worship our God together. So glad you are with us. It's a special day today for Logan and Abby. They're going to join together in holy matrimony this afternoon. So we rejoice and be praying uh, for them as a couple. I was so lost in abiding in Christ, I forgot to call them up last week. Uh, and then next week, Matthew and Hannah are going to be getting married. Are they here? Oh, I'm going to remember to call you up at the end, so be ready. And if I forget, somebody help me here. So I want to encourage you with an opportunity for outreach. We have an upcoming Christmas concert that we've been telling you about. It's going to be Friday night. Ken, tell me if I got it right. December 8th? I forgot to check the card. Friday night, December 8th here. Uh, invitation cards are in the back. If you can grab those to hand out to uh, coworkers, neighbors, family, uh, I've read through every song that they're going to be singing, and they, they just are leading you to this sweet place of rest in Christ. And then at the close, we're going to present the gospel of Jesus Christ of Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. If you're here even this morning, um, I pray if you need that, that you would find that rest for your soul in Jesus Christ. Uh, there'll be refreshments afterwards to come then and reach out. To any visitors, uh, the children are going to sing a song in it, and it just doesn't get any sweeter. So little kids, just go smile at all your relatives and invite them to come. If you're missing your front teeth, even better, and just ask them to come hear you sing. Uh, so let's redeem this opportunity and that all of us would be praying for this outreach as a body. And then remember that Christmas Eve uh, is going to be on a Sunday, and Pastor Rutland is going to preach uh, the beautiful news of the new birth of Jesus Christ, and then we'll have a candlelight service that night. So um, be doing the work of an evangelist uh, during this time to let people know why Jesus Christ came into the world. I always like this one quote by John Piper where, you know, when someone says image is everything, he said, get a look and, and say, no, God's glory is everything. And so I just want you to try that. Merry Christmas to the clerk. Let me tell you why it's going to be a Merry Christmas for me. Because Jesus Christ came in the world to die for my sins. Get a look. Go, go out. Get ready to tell of the glory of Christ. It's all for free. What a gospel. Just don't make it a secret. Don't, don't, let it, don't hide it. Tell it. It's to be proclaimed. So let's come this morning. We're going to finish where I began last week. Turn to John chapter 15, and we began just taking it up and considering this idea of abiding in Jesus Christ. Let me uh, read in John 15, 1. Jesus stands again, or sitting, I don't know which. He says, I am, ego me, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser, one of the most full verses in the whole Bible. That's why you can have hope and joy this morning. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so it might bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you, apostles. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Let's pray. Father, beautiful words from a beautiful Savior in a very intimate setting. I pray they should be worshipped at. They're very difficult to try to expose it. God, I pray that you would grant us the blessing of understanding this word and then the worship that would come with it. I pray for every soul in this room or live stream that by the end of this service they would know what it means to abide, that you would um, guide them and lead them deeper and deeper 
into this beautiful call that Jesus gives us in this metaphor. So God, put away all the distractions. I pray, let us just stare into the face of Jesus Christ for the next 45 minutes. God, meet us here, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Last week, we started looking at this passage and we hit, we hit gold. And so what I want to do is review and keep working at this amazing statement by Jesus himself. As he's departing this world, the upper room discourse, he's preparing to die on a cross the next night. He's ministering to his disciples to prepare them for when he's gone and what's coming. And so thus to prepare us while he dwells in heaven and we're waiting for his return. And he tells us some amazing and profound things in this passage about fruit bearing. And he desires that we bear fruit. So in verse 8, the Father will be glorified by it. And so our, our longing to bear fruit is that God will get glory because it's fruit that is just evident that it comes from God. And, and so there's our call in this world. And I hope that that sounds familiar because in Romans, when we opened that book and closed that book, Paul called, I'm writing to bring about the obedience of faith. And that's what I'm, I'm seeing is this abiding in the vine, this, this faith that is, as you uh, abide and believe and live in this gospel, the fruit that will come out of it, Romans 12 through 16. And Paul said, I write, I'm, I'm going after obedience of the faith for the glory of God. And so he's just so consistent as he's led by the Holy Spirit. And so I want this section to encourage and strengthen and bless you with the transformation that Jesus desires for his followers. To not be content with not growing. It's almost the in thing anywhere uh, anymore in American Christianity. To become comfortable without bearing fruit. Much fruit. More fruit. He just can't say it enough in every different angle. What I love is that the command here, catch this, is not to bear fruit. It's not commanded. So many look at the fruit of the Spirit as a command. I'm going to go work at love and peace. I'm going to go produce it and I'll go make these works. If if I need fruit, I'll go get it. But the command of this passage is to abide. Jesus is saying, you abide in me and you will bear much fruit. The sufficiency that is given to the child of God as you are joined to Jesus Christ by faith in him and his finished work that he did on this earth and on the cross. It's infinite, and it cannot be overstated. And so last week we began looking at, he said, I'm the true vine. I'm the vine that if you get attached to it, it bears fruit. And what came to my mind this week in praying was Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah says, let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved Concerning his vineyard, my well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill, and he dug it all around. He removed its stones, the Canaanites, and planted it with the choicest vine, the, the Jewish race. And he built a tower in the middle of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it. And then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced worthless ones. That was the fruit of this nation. It produced worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I didn't do? What more could I have done for you to bear fruit? I gave you everything. And why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. And the enemies came in and destroyed them. I will break down its wall and will become trampled ground. <clears throat> I will lay it waste and it will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. And I will also charge the clouds to not rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress." Woe to those who add house to house and join field to field until there's no more room so that you live alone in the midst of the land. And so here's this beautiful choicest branch and God did everything for it to bear fruit and all it bore was worthless ones. And so he he destroyed it. And now we're coming this morning and he's saying, I'm the true vine. I am the true vine. 
And, and if you abide in me, you will bear the fruit that God the Father has desired. So we're not the vine. He is. And apart from him, you can do nothing. He says it again and again. You just got to be convinced of this. Apart from him, you can do nothing. And that is why God cannot command us to bear fruit in and of ourselves because it will never happen. So many try to live the Christian life and bear fruit for God in their own strength, their own efforts, their own merit, their own sufficiency. And Paul's saying it will never happen. He said the law was given so that you could realize you could never do it. You could never climb your way into heaven by your own morality. So does a branch need to bear fruit first so that it can be joined to the vine? And some of you are sitting here this morning trying to do that. If I can bear enough fruit, then I can be joined to the vine. And we just, we're joined to the vine by faith in Christ so that we might bear fruit. I want to make sure that you do not miss that. You don't go bear your fruit so you can be joined to the vine. I had a brother this week share with his kids. He, he takes a straw and a balloon and, and he says, okay, now, can the straw blow up the balloon? And, and the kids are, no. That straw in a million years will never blow up that balloon. And, and that balloon is fruit until the mouth of God, which we're calling a vine, Jesus Christ, blows and fruit comes out. And so the straw will never boast and say, look at the straw. Silly illustration, but I, I liked it. Right? The power of God through a straw is going to bear fruit for God. And then the second half of the verse, there's more help for us to bear fruit. We have a vine dresser called God the Father. And he's going to care for the branches and nurture and, and prune them. And he's going to prune those that are bearing fruit with trials and afflictions and difficulties so that you might bear more fruit. And so I don't want you to miss this. Just all week thinking on this, how beautiful the Trinity is in working to bear this fruit. You got this vine, Jesus Christ, who's all our sap and sufficiency and the Father just pruning with perfect wisdom, working all things together for your good so that you, catch this, abide deeper and deeper and more dependent upon the vine. He's not pruning you just so it hurts. He's pruning you and the fruit is that I'm going to go deeper into Jesus Christ with how hard this trial is and what I'm going through this morning. It's not to make you miserable. It's to make you go deeper into Christ, to abide more, look more to him, love him, treasure him more through the word of God, showing you the fullness and sufficiency of Christ. That's the Holy Spirit's work. So this whole Trinity is working for our fruit for the glory of God. And so he doesn't prune you, hear this, because he doesn't love you. If you're being pruned this morning, we run to, does God love me? He says, if you abide in my love, you'll bear much fruit. And so this pruning is never because he doesn't love you, but because he does, and he wants you to abide deeper in his love. He, that, that's why he does that. He doesn't want to destroy you. He wants to make you more beautiful, to bear much fruit for his name. I heard this statement last week where it says it was a loss to keep. So <laughs> whatever was on my branch, it's a loss if I kept it. So he prunes it and, and, and it was a loss to keep. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a loss to keep and then a gain to lose. So if he prunes it, it's, it's for your good and it's for gain. What a blessing. So the beauty of the vine dresser is how can I ever see my pain as beauty? That's been my battle since I got saved. This is what has helped me. Jesus was cut off from the land of the living, said Isaiah, so that I could be cut back and pruned as a child of God. Why I can be joined to the vine and be pruned and to drink deeper of the vine is what makes me want to abide all the more. Because he, he, was, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter and he was pierced through for my transgressions. And so as I see that, I just want to abide all the more. And all the trials are driving me deeper into that. And as a shepherd, my joy is I have watched 
pruning in your lives that scares me sometimes. And I just keep watching you go deeper into the vine and the fruit that's coming out. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. The Father will cut off dead branches. Any good gardener, when there's a branch that's dead, you've got to cut it off for the good of the, the plant. And so it's going to prune alive ones so that they'll bear more fruit. And the question that I hope everyone asks, which one am I? Which one am I? Remember, it's a metaphor. Once you're in Christ, you can't be cut off. <laughs> so the metaphor is you're hanging out around the vine, but you're not really attached to it. And you're dead. And you're barren. He says, I'm going to cut it off in our metaphor. So the ones here in verse 3, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And that word in John 1.12 is the Jews rejected him when he came. He said, but to those who receive me, I gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So uh, the one who receives Christ instead of rejects him in his work and all his beauty for salvation is the one that's going to get pruned. So which branch am I? I've received the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a branch that's going to get pruned. But if you sit here and you still reject Christ, you're going to be a dead branch that'll be cut off. And now the key verse in verse 4, abide in me and I in you. What intimacy as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. And so living into Christ and all that he is now for you as a child of God. So we looked at last week, the way you get in the, the, the vine is through faith in Christ. It's through what he has done and you can never be taken out and it's sufficient. Your sins are cleansed. And so part of abiding is I have to live into the gospel. I have to believe it. I have to know I'm a child of God. I had the sweetest blessing on uh, Thursday night. I was teaching on assurance and I went around all the community group and just said, hey, where are you guys at with your assurance? And some of them I've counseled who, who didn't have it. And as we went around the room, everyone, I said, you don't have to share if you don't want to. And they all did. And when we're done, this is sweet beauty of full assurance for the right reasons and everyone sitting in that room. That's abiding. It's your, your sins are forgiven. He died for you. Live, live into that. Stay in that. You, you get away from that and you won't bear much fruit. So the very fact you're calling to abide is because you are joined to that vine by faith in Jesus Christ. The fullness of the vine is infinite. You can't get over the beauty of the vine. Christ is our all and all. Abide in him. He's sufficient for everything. I asked you last week, how, do then, how then do I get all that fullness into my branches so that it bears fruit? Well, abide in him, which Greek word remain, stay. And so you can't ever become unattached. This isn't, when you're not abiding, doesn't mean you're not in union. So this abiding is the believer who's staying and remaining in Christ, who is now your brother, you're one with him, he, you're a husband and wife with him. There's all the beautiful intimacies. I, I want to, by faith, stay in this relationship. I want to trust him for all of my life. There's nothing outside of what Christ isn't sufficient for you this morning. So to abide is, I'm safe, I'm, I'm not fearful, I'm a little sheep lying down in green grass because I'm not worried about anything because the Lord's my shepherd. I, I can live into that, that's what he's purchased for us. By faith, I live into what this book says. I'm getting ahead of myself, that's verse 7, sorry. So faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ now lives in me. So the life that I now live as a believer in the vine, I live by faith, faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I, I just live in the reality of the gospel. He loved me. He gave himself for me. If I stay in that, if I remain in that truth is where fruit is going to spring up. We looked at Hudson Taylor last week, and I was so blessed I came to the men's breakfast yesterday. I had no idea what we were going to be studying. And my dear brother stood up and taught on Hudson Taylor, and he's been just soaking it in. And, and the beams are breaking into his heart. Um, and the fellowship with him is so rich. I didn't want to go home yesterday. Thank you. 
some of his friends. It's interesting around that time, George Mueller. George Mueller didn't just take care of orphans and pastor a church. He also changed China with all those who came to faith because he, he would just pray and be led and send gifts to China where Hudson Taylor was. And George Mueller just rested in the sufficiency of Christ to feed all of those orphans just again and again. He never asked for any money. He just prayed, trusted, and God provided so much that he could help missionaries all over the world. And one man said, how long do you have a quiet time, George? He said, I, I, sometimes it's 10 minutes and sometimes it's four hours. My devotional time is until my heart is warmed in Christ, I don't leave. It's abiding. Spurgeon was his other friend. And if you cut Spurgeon open, he bled Christ. Paul, for me to live is Christ. My life is Christ. He's my sufficiency. He's my all. He's what I shoot at. He's what I love. He's what I aim for. Christ. This week, you get John Newton. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. And when God's showing you something, everywhere you go, it just keeps coming. And listen to this. So he, he says, grace is all that I need. He said, it's a sovereign grace. It's an all-sufficient grace. It's a alone sufficient grace that flows freely and fully from the person of Jesus Christ. But grace through faith unites us to Christ, the living vine. Gospel, you're united from whom as the root of all fullness, a constant supply of sap and influence is derived into each of his mystical branches, enabling them to bring forth fruit unto God and, and to persevere and to abound therein. A life in union with Christ is the life of grace. We're joined to him and we draw from Christ grace for every need. Everything to put sin to death, to hope in Maranatha and his second coming. I draw everything. I need a heart for the lost. I abide in Christ. Give me your heart for the lost. And he goes on to say, grace not only connects us to Christ, but grace is the daily motivation for us to press closer toward Christ, to be daily hungering and thirsting after him and daily receiving from his fullness daily. Even grace for grace, that you may rejoice in his all sufficiency and may taste his love, abide in his love in every dispensation. We seek more grace by seeking to experience more of Christ. The great God, and I meant to put these up here so you could just snap them with your phone, but come hunt me down and I'll give them to you. The great God is pleased to manifest himself in Christ as the God of grace. This grace is manifold, it's pardoning, it's converting, it's restoring, it's persevering grace. It, it's bestowed upon the miserable and the worthless. Grace finds the sinner in a hopeless, helpless state, sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. Grace pardons the guilt, cleanses the pollution, and subdues the power of sin. Grace sustains the bruised reed, binds up the broken heart, and cherishes the smoking flax into a flame. Grace restores the soul when you're wandering. It revives the fainting. It heals when wounded. It upholds it when ready to fall. It teaches it to fight. It goes before it in the battle. And at last makes it more than a conqueror over all opposition. And then bestows the crown of everlasting life. But all this grace is established and displayed by a covenant and the man Christ Jesus. And without respect to him as living, dying, rising, reigning, and interceding on behalf of sinners would have never been known. This is why I can abide in him. Tony Reinke, who wrote about John Newton, said, grace is not currency dispensed from an impersonal, computerized ATM. Grace is deeply personal. It's glue securing the branch of our Christian life into the trunk of Christ's all-sufficiency. Grace binds us to the person of Christ, to his vital life, and to the full spectrum of his all-sufficient benefits. The root of all grace is Jesus Christ, and he says, abide in me.
Newton's prayer for his friends. He said, all I can wish for my dear friends is that you might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. To know him is the shortest description of true grace. To know him better is the surest mark of growth in grace. And to know him perfectly is eternal life. Paul said that I may know him. Abide in me is the sweetest command I've ever been given. This is not a ball and chain. I pray no one in here sees that as a ball and chain. This is the fount of every blessing. And in verse 11, he says, as you abide, your joy would be made full. There's joy in abiding in this beautiful, full vine and sweet Christ. So one little application now. James says that faith without works is dead. And so the first thought is, okay, I better go produce works. I better go make some fruit. And so let, let, let's look at the, the works and the fruit. Have I done enough? Did I do enough this week? Are they real? Did I spend all my days on it? Jesus' command is, look at Christ. Abide. Faith. And it will produce fruit. It will bear the fruit. You can live a life looking at the vine from every verse in Scripture, and this fruit is just beautiful. And what I love is it just comes out in many different ways in all the saints. But at our 25th anniversary, I walked up to about six of the saints who have been here almost 25 years, and they're just oak trees. And the beautiful ways they reflect grace in Christ, uh, it just took my breath away. Abide. Get as close to Christ as you can every day. Hold fast to him for life and godliness. Whenever I try to do my own illustrations, they never come out well, so I like to use others, but this one's mine. So just, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Just picture getting married, and the groom just, or bride, whoever, just, I get married, and I go away. And I, I leave my spouse, and I just go around telling everybody, I'm married. Look at my ring. I got married on February 10th, 1989 to Laura Murphy. And you just keep going. Everywhere you go, you just keep talking about your marriage. It's so beautiful. And just, well, when's the last time you saw her? Well, February 10th, 1989. And you're like, that's not a marriage. Why did you get married? To have a, a relationship with my wife. So I, I, got, I got saved in whatever, 1967. You're old, like me. And then, so just all you talk about is when you got saved. I got saved back here. I got saved back here. And it's like, are you abiding in Christ? Do you have relationship and love and marital bliss with the vine who's offering everything to you? I see there are more believers that you're not abiding in Christ. That is so distant. And you just brag about your marriage from 20 years ago. You got married to commune and know and be intimate with Christ. So before I go on, something really important. John Newton said it's so simple, but this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And so I don't want to set you up and walk out and say, man, this is going to be easy. I just got to abide. It's so easy. Um, he says it's the hardest thing I've ever done to just stay in the gospel and stay in Christ and grace and, and live there. Why? Because your flesh wants to say, without Christ, I can do a lot. I'm sufficient. I can do this. And the whole world system is, you, you can do it. You're, you're a mover and a shaker and you can accomplish things and you got a devil doing everything he can to keep you from abiding in Christ. If this is the secret to bearing much fruit, all hell is set against you abiding. Know that. Don't be shook when this is hard. This is going to be a battle. Everything is set against this rest. It's just the way we think, the way we get acceptance, we're, we're in a battle. And I believe this is why Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. You have to fight to rest. There are means of grace that God has given to us and, and there to lead us to this place of rest. And so there is a fight and a battle to rest. And so I'm going to get in this word. And as I've been abiding so sweetly, I, my quiet times, I don't want to come out. 
And I just, I got to, there's times though where I got to make myself. And I just want you to see that you are not fighting to produce works. You're fighting to rest and abide in his sufficiency of all that Christ is for you. And so don't let the means of grace become Christ. And that might not make sense, but I've seen people make Bible reading the end goal. I've seen people coming to church be their end goal. And so the means of grace is Jesus. You stop there. And there's a lead us to Him, to abide, to stay, and to remain. And then how well you do at the means of grace is your vine. You believe that the way Christ loves you is by how well you did in the means of grace. And it's just, he can't love me because I, I missed two Bible readings this week. And so you, your, your vine is the means of grace. And that's how you think God loves you and accepts you. And so I need to abide in the vine and draw all from him. Write this down because I'm running out of time. Hebrews 4 uh, I'll just share it with you. Hebrews 4 is, there, there's a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And, and it says on the seventh day, God rested. And I always ask the question, was he tired? No, he, he was finished. So he rested. And he says, now Jesus Christ went up on a cross and, and he did the work of salvation. He did everything necessary for you to be saved. Everything. And it was finished. Tetelestai. And now there's a Sabbath rest, he says, for the people of God, for those who rest from their works and come only unto his work. So there's a resting from your performance to get God to accept you and to enter into his Sabbath, his Shabbat, his rest, is to trust and look to his sufficiency and his work on the cross alone. Just give me Jesus. I think sometimes we focus on busyness for Jesus instead of friendship and relationship with Jesus. So with that short introduction, I want to show you the fruit of abiding in the vine. This is why I picked this whole series for us. And I got 10 minutes to tell you about it. That is Murphy's Law. So if you'll come with me to verse 7 for more gold. So Jesus says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And so I told you when I went away, I was going to study on prayer, corporate prayer, and again on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. in that room, we are joining together and just pouring out our hearts to God for his much fruit if anyone wants to join us. And I found the answer. And God put in neon lights in front of me so even I couldn't miss it. What this could do for Southside is it could produce more fruit together. And I want you to listen to the vastness. Just listen to that promise. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. One of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, one of the most abused verses in the Bible. This is a blank, it's a blank check. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. The God of the universe is is telling you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done. Whatever the God of the universe who has no limitations or ability, he will do. (laughs) And what's the whole context? Fruit bearing. What is being offered to us here, I want you to catch this, is you pray for fruit, this real beautiful God-honoring fruit. Ask it, you got it. And yes, I know that this promise is taken out of context to be used and abused in wrong ways, to use this promise on our own vines and our wrong desires. But the context gives life and wings. Um, You're going to love this. I read, I have read so many books on prayer since I got saved. Um, I I took a class in seminary. I think we had to read like six books and I got to sit under one of the, one of the best prayer warriors probably in the history of America. This guy prayed four hours every day, Jim Roscup, who is now in the presence of Christ. Um, I've employed many things that have, I've been taught, and all of it has helped my prayer life. But what broke in on my vacation, it's quadrupled it. And the fruit of it is 
I haven't tried to work at it. <laughs> Everything else I read, I tried to work at prayer. I got something so sweet for you. Are you ready? Prayer can be a discipline for sure, but I'm convinced from this passage it's a fruit from abiding in Jesus and His Word abiding in us. And this is going to be a fruit that's going to come out of your life. When by faith that you live into the fullness of Christ, you, you know the full Christ that you have, and you're convinced that apart from Him I can do nothing. You live in that. You know that. And his heart and his desires then flow into yours as you're abiding. And you know what comes out of you? Prayer. Supernaturally comes flowing out of this connection. So discipline, there's times of very focused prayer, yes. But when I'm abiding all day long, as you walk with Jesus, you can be at work, you can do this wherever you go. You are so aware, I'm loved by Christ. He died and I know my sins are forgiven. I know that he's sufficient to be a testimony in this office where everybody is just ragging and, and condemning and slandering. I, I, I know there, I can be light. And I just want you to begin to see that when you know you can do nothing and he can do everything, you're just going to be praying all the time. Like, you don't, you don't have to say, wait, it's time to pray. It's, this is organic. That you will just be at the throne of grace all day long. When you get in your car, I just need grace. Lord, bring me home safe. When I walk in this door, help me to not be grumpy and love my family. Um, just all day long, you can't do anything. He can do everything. Isn't that a perfect marriage for prayer? Like what, what more could be a, a happier marriage? I love it. So let me prove it to you. Verse 7. If you abide in me, I think I've talked about that enough. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, so the word of Christ, which we'd say is the whole Bible. John 8, 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. You're, you're abiding in my word. So abide in me and then abide in my words, my truth, what is revealed in this book. And so this is big. We, we abide in Christ. We love him. We trust him. We depend on him. We draw all power from him. We get protection from him, help in the time of need, healing in his wings, daily provision, uh, perseverance and trial. We get everything from Christ and his word is to abide in us so that we're renewing our minds. And this word of God is, is leading us to the vine. He's teaching us. He's growing us. We're thinking his thoughts about all of this world and myself. It's to get in us. This word of God is to, to renew our minds and make us new. Let, let these words be abiding, remaining, staying in you, not just little quick ditties and you walk away and the word's gone. It's, you're going to dwell. You're going to meditate. You're going to go to studies. You, you're going to get in this book on your own because I need the words of Christ dwelling in me. So when I pray, I'm praying God's will. I'm, I'm abiding in Christ where I get his will. I get his word that tells me his will. And now all, anything I ask will be what I should ask for. And you'll have it. Wow. What I'm seeing here from a preacher I heard this week, <coughs> the way we experience Christ by faith is mediated to us through his words. So it, it, it's the word of God that's mediating the sufficiency of the vine. This word is showing us the glorious beauty of Christ. And so this word, as, I'm, as it's abiding in me, it's showing me the Savior. And, and as, as, as for you in John 2, 24, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. There's just this beautiful connection. The life of Christ, His love, His sufficiency, the flow from the vine into us to bear fruit, and it's all mediated through the Word of God. And so this, this Word is so important to show me the vine and to let these words dwell in me. I think that's what we were talking about is what kept Hudson Taylor. Like it, it didn't seem like he had a profound theology, but a profound relationship with Christ, but he was in the Bible every day. He said for, I think it was two hours in prayer in the Bible. It's, it's mediating, it's 
showing him Christ and his sufficiency. So he's disciplining himself to, to drink up the vine and to take it in. That's where I, I learned the vine is in the word of God. And, and Jesus said, all these words pointed to me. I'm the fulfillment. I get in his word, the Bible, and I just let these words dwell and they reveal Christ. And verse after verse is the beauty and the fullness and the sufficiency of the vine. And his words are teaching me truth. And he said, I'm the truth. And they're renewing and they're transforming my mind to have Jesus' thoughts about life. Simon Peter answered Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. I just come and drink those words. But I'm afraid that much of our prayer is coming to God when we need him and then leaving until we feel like we need him again. It's not an abiding, continual relationship lived upon the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see, he's not an impersonal vine. The vine loves us. The vine was crucified for us. So I'm abiding in his love. And when you die, you don't go to meet Christ. Wayne Watson, this is back in the 80s, I apologize. He wrote a song and he said, I want to get so close to him that it's no big change on the day that Jesus calls my name. I want to know him so intimately that when he calls me home, it's not this huge change. I already know him and love him and have relationship and abide. I love what Paul said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And then with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness and your hearts to God. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. How, how does he sign a blank check like that? Well, if you abide in me, Spurgeon said, oh, my precious Lord, if I want anything which is not in thee, I desire to always be without it. Anything that we ask out of his fullness for the Father's glory to bear much fruit, he's going to give it. And if my words abide in you, the best praying man is the man who is most familiar with the promises of God. Prayer is nothing but taking God's promises to him. You meet God with his own words. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly so that you might prevail at the throne of grace and bear much fruit. Spurgeon said, abiding in Christ and his words abiding in you are like the right hand and the left hand of Moses, which were, were held up in prayer so that Amalek was smitten and Israel was delivered and God was glorified. So Christ could make such a statement because this person's will is God's will. Our, our will is now a shadow of God's will because we're abiding in Christ and his words are abiding in us. We want fruit. We want fruit badly so that the Father will be glorified. The motive has got to be right. We want this fruit and this fruit will change people. It will change you. It will change societies and it will change nations. Don't you desire this kind of prevailing prayer? What a difference this would make at Southside Bible Church if we got this. Ask whatever you wish and it'll be granted and it'll bear much fruit for the kingdom of God. My last seven weeks in, in understanding and growing in this, prayer, it, it, it really is becoming organic if you'll stay there. And it just, it will flow into everything that you do. And so I, I pray that it will do a mighty work in the saints of God. And so we have a vine, it's Jesus Christ, and you've been joined to him by such a glorious gospel. You have a relationship with him. God did everything necessary. He, he took away the enmity in your heart and the enmity in God's heart by pouring out his wrath so that now you have peace with God. And you have a vine dresser who's perfectly pruning your branches. There's nothing in your life right now that he is not doing so that you might bear more fruit and dive more into that beautiful vine. And as we abide in this and his, his word abides in us, our prayer lives are going to begin to bring fruit everywhere because whatever we ask, he'll give. And when we do this, the Father is going to be glorified. And as we abide in his love, your joy is going to be made full. 
Your joy will no longer be based on circumstances, but the vine, and it will be made full. One preacher said, Oh God, make my life fruitful for your name's sake and not wither in worldliness and unbelief. Prune whatever you must do to make me fruitful and let my joy in you bear fruit in others for your glory alone. Amen? I love the vine. He's altogether lovely and, and we get to abide in it. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for the vine. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for convicting us of sin and judgment and righteousness and showing us the sufficiency of the vine to be able to be saved, to be cleansed and forgiven of all of our sins when we come to Christ by faith. And I thank you, Lord, that that can never be undone. Let everyone in here abide in that delight and the beauty and the glory of the gospel that has saved them and will save them. God, thank you. And I pray, let us abide. Let us stay there and, and just continue to draw near in communion with Jesus Christ. We can never lose our union, thank you. But our communion can suffer. God, grow us to stay in this beautiful, all-sufficient vine that this vine bears fruit. We'll stay in it. Fruit will come. And you'll get all the glory. And so help us Christ, to look to you for everything. And I pray that, that as we abide in the word of Christ, we would come to it often and that our minds would be renewed and our prayer lives would start praying your will. And as we do, we will get everything that we ask because it will bear fruit and you will be glorified. I pray, be glorified by Southside Bible Church. God, I thank you for all the beauty of what we've seen and I pray now, let us help each other stay in the vine, abide, and bear much fruit. God, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the precious one. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen.